Well, hello, hello everybody and uh, welcome to our meeting tonight. And we're very honored and pleased to have as our speaker tonight, Brian Garente. And um, a lot of you know him all, probably know him already. He's very active in the birding community. And um, his topic tonight is, how did that bird get here? Meteorological musings on migration. And it's uh, the topic is about how the wind influences bird migration and um, how wind patterns uh, bring birds to Colorado that might not otherwise be here, vagrants. And um, some of like the red wings that were here earlier this year that not red winged blackbirds, but the other species of red wings. And he'll tell us more about that. But Brian is a meteorologist and interact, um, inter instructional designer at NCAR, UCAR, excuse me, the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. And he trains meteorologists, other meteorologists on forecasting. And he does this nationally and internationally. And for instance, he has helped, he has trained meteorologists on forecasting for the Olympics, some which would be a very important job. And he had, he got an undergrad at UNC in Greeley and did a lot of birding in Weld County. And he got his graduate degree in meteorology in Illinois and became interested in the, there he had an epiphany about the convergence of bird migration and weather. And he was listening to um, nocturnal flight calls on the low level jet stream, and which is a, a typical atmospheric feature of the Great Plains. And so he's become an expert in this field in this combined, this convergence of the two fields. And um, so I'm just going, I'm gonna introduce Brian, now to all of you, and we're all looking forward, Brian, to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Carol. Much appreciated. Um, let me share my screen and we'll get started. Now I have to do a little bit of management here to make sure I can still see my chat window and all the participants list just in case. Okay. Is everyone able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So if you see me looking down, I've got two monitors going on. I'm trying to monitor every possible thing that could happen right now. Um, so bear with me. To get us started, um, I want to introduce you to what I've previously talked about in a BCIS uh, talk about how meteorology plays a role in bird migration and what pieces of meteorology we need to actually be looking at to figure out the best places to go bird watching. So this is the quick summary of my other hour long talk that I give. And the points here that I really need you to focus on are three key weather factors. Those would be the winds, the extended duration of whatever pattern that may be, and the convergence and funneling. I will show you all of these, um, and I will explain them to you in the following slide, actually. When it comes to the winds, there are two pieces of the winds that matter. Those are, is it coming from a good source region for whatever bird you're hoping to get as a migrant? And are we looking at the right altitude? because birds migrate at different altitudes. Um, most of them, um, most of the, I'll say predictable migrants, uh, will fly between 500 and 1.5, 500 meters and 1500 meters. So uh, that's about a thousand feet. And I'm probably doing my conversion wrong, a thousand feet and 3000 feet, something towards that um, sort of level. So, Let's take a look at a pattern. That actually brought us a lot of birds. 
And as Sandra has pointed out, feel free to post questions in the chat as you think of them. Uh, I can respond either during or at the end. And if anyone has the need, feel free to raise your hand as well with the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom panel. So we'll see a lot of these maps coming up in my presentation. And I need you to be very confident in being able to read them. So I'm going to spend a good amount of time on this slide and help you understand what exactly is going on. So I had listed three things that we were concerned about, the winds, the extended duration of the pattern, and convergence and funneling. Let's start with the altitude of the winds. I'm not showing you exactly which altitude this is, but this is the 850 hectopascal or 850 millibar pressure level. Ignore the fact that it's pressure and try to believe me, suspend all disbelief, try to believe me that that is about a 500 meters up to a kilometer up from the ground. And that is dependent on where you are in the United States because the pressure surfaces actually bend. Just bear with me, call 850 a good place to look for bird migration at this moment. When we look at the winds that are flowing on this map, I've got a green circle right here, which in this case happens to represent me in Longmont. So you can think of it as Longmont, you can think of it as Boulder, you can think of it as Lyons, Loveland, somewhere in that uh, general area is where that green circle is. Let me give you some outlines to help you understand the rest of what's going on on this map. Way up here, here's the Aleutian Islands comes through uh, to the southern Alaskan coast, down the west coast of the United States, California is in here, and then we get to the Baja Peninsula down here and into Mexico. Come back up the other side, Gulf of Mexico, down to Florida, up to the North Carolina, New York, up to Maine, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and up into the Arctic. We've got the Great Lakes on here as well in this sort of uh, light outline. And there are rivers annotated on here, but they're pretty hard to see. There are no state board borders, unfortunately. This is not my website that I pulled these from, so it doesn't have the state borders, and I apologize for that. What I will do is as we get further on into this, I will outline Colorado for you at one point, so you can see exactly where it is. Doesn't so much matter on this exact map at the moment. The motion that is going on on these maps is the wind. And it is, yeah, we'll go into that. We'll not touch too far onto what exactly this time is. What I want you to note is the colors also on here. The blues are where there's not much wind flow. The greens are where there's, I believe the number is about 10 knots of, of wind. And the yellows get you up in the higher values. The reds and oranges get you up in even higher values than that. So as the color gets redder, you should think of faster winds out of that. So it should go blue, green, yellow, orange, red in terms of wind speeds. When we look at these winds and we try to say, well, what's going to be happening in Boulder vicinity at this time? Well, we're seeing winds actually coming from, let's track it backwards, coming from well up here into Yukon territory, maybe Northern Alberta, maybe even Nunavut, um, depending on exactly where those boundaries are. Because again, they're not on this map. And if we think about this pattern sitting here for a number of hours, if this pattern were here, say, for 24 hours, which in fact, this pattern almost was on this exact date, you could think that birds would be coming from northern Alberta, southeast uh, Yukon Territory, southwest Nunavut, and making their way along these winds down towards us. Let's be clearer, though. That was our source region, somewhere back here. Look at how these winds are converging towards our area, actually. There's a good amount of streamlines in here that are coming to us. So one could actually say that most of the birds that are sort of in this realm, I'm outlining it with my uh, 
cursor right now, all the birds that would be flying in this realm here might end up in Boulder or near Boulder. That is the funneling, the channeling, the convergence that may happen because of the winds. So birds might take off into those winds. And as they're flying, those winds are slowly converging on each other. And as you get to Boulder, they've actually really converged. So you've taken what may have been a lot of birds spread out over a large area and put those lots of birds into a significantly smaller area. When you get a pattern like this, where you have convergence into your area or this funneling effect, that's when you really get the great birding days. You've taken all these birds over a large area, jammed them into a small area, and they're looking for all of that limited food that is available. I've covered thus altitude, source region. We've talked some about the extended duration of this pattern. This one was a 24 hour pattern. And we've talked a little about convergence and funneling. Any questions before I move off of this? Because I want to make sure you understand what's on this map before I move any further. Feel free to throw a question in the chat window, unmute yourself and uh, give a shout out, or uh, raise your hand in the reactions if that works for you. This is the crux of everything that we're going to do. So I want to make sure that you are with me at this moment. Brian, this is Virginia Winter. I have a question about whether the, um, the movement on this map is a representation of October of a given year or it's live? So this one actually is um, October 13th of 2018 at a certain hour of the day. Thank you. Um, it's a good question and I was trying to avoid it, um, but you're asking so it's worth talking about. Um, each of the maps that I'm gonna show if it is a static map, you don't see a big chunk uh, where it's moving to the next um, time. All of my uh, movies, all of my images will be a single time unless I tell you otherwise. So that means this is a snapshot of what the atmosphere looks like at that moment. That doesn't mean that the atmosphere isn't going to change from hour to hour. I will get a little more into that. Um, it's a really good question to start us off. Thank you, Virginia. Elena, I see you've got a question in there. Why does it look like the movements of the winds stop there around your location? Um, because the 850 millibar surface that we're looking at here actually runs into the mountains. That's exactly why there's that sort of blue line right here. Um, that is actually the mountains. That's where the, the winds run into the tallest points of the mountains. Um, so good observation. Then you have to ask the question, well, what happens to that blue line that goes sort of out here? That's actually a cold front. Um, so there's multiple types of topography, if you will, on this map. And we will definitely talk about it more. Elena, it's a good observation to even just see that the mountains are there. Um, and it does help us see the difference between the eastern plains and the western slope. Um, so it, it shows up every so often, not all the time. Though. Other questions while we're sitting here on this slide, I want to make sure that everyone knows what is going on. While I'm waiting for any last questions, I do need to tell you that I do post QR codes in the bottom right hand corner. Um, in most slides, it'll be in the bottom right hand corner. Those QR codes, you can point your phone at it point your phone's camera at it, and you can jump to a website that actually has these animations on them. It may not be best to do it during this live presentation, but it's definitely going to be useful for those folks who are watching the recorded version on YouTube to be able to play around. Um, already did, very cool, excellent. People are using the QR codes. Feel free to do that. Um, it is easiest to use a mobile device to get that to work. Um, I will be posting throughout um, when there is something that you will need to look at. We'll be posting those to the chat window as those come up. So I don't see any more questions in the chat window or I'm not hearing any. So let's 
take a step forward. The first thing I want to do is talk about something that seems whimsical, let's say, scoters in Colorado. I don't think generally of scoters being in Colorado. Um, and it was in the early 2000s that Joey Kellner, Locke Kilpatrick, um, Glenn Walbeck were all searching uh, mountain lakes and seemed to discover that scoters were showing up in Colorado mountain lakes between October and December. This image happens to be of 11 Mile Reservoir, which is one of the first places that they were finding uh, that there were dense amounts of scoters in Colorado. And so I'll call that the Kellner effect. That's what a number of people have called it. I don't necessarily need to attribute it to, to Joey specifically, uh, but that's what I've heard others call it. So that's where we'll go. Then you get to the Garenti effect, which is just me being coy, I guess. I'm trying to get you to think like me. And the question is, what's the real role of the wind pattern? Is there a role in this? Are scoters showing up in Colorado because of the wind pattern? And is there a consistent pattern where these birds actually show up in Colorado? So what I wanna take some time to do is show you the pattern that happened actually just recently, um, over the last week and a half at this point, where there were scoters showing up in Colorado. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the specific days that the scoters showed up and talk to you about the days that no scoter show, showed up, none were seen. And it wasn't just on a weekend. I know there's that possibility that everyone goes birding on the weekend. So you find more birds on the weekends than you do during the week. But in this case, it was actually spread apart or spread across a good amount of time. So let me start you off with a, here's the pattern. So again, here's the West Coast of the United States. We are approximately in the green circle. I think that one's actually Denver because that's where a good number of the scoters were seen. And I'm stepping through I'm going to loop through this many different times, so don't worry if you're missing something right off the bat. These winds are, again, 850 millibar winds. And you see this general pattern of from the west or west-northwest. And as we move through time, that starts to break down. And that's about here that it starts to break down. You see that we're no longer connected all the way out to the coast like we may have been earlier. And we've got a couple more time frames after that where we're really disconnected from the West Coast. We're getting stuff maybe from Baja Peninsula, if that, or maybe more internal to um, the mountain Southwest. And then this next system starts coming in and we go back to the beginning. I'm looping back. Let's talk through this more specifically. I'm gonna go full screen just to make it hopefully a little easier for you to see. Let's watch as the winds start coming directly in the Colorado. Here we are on the 13th, almost to the 14th. Here we are on the 14th and you can see this pattern coming directly through uh, Oregon, Idaho, Utah, and in the Colorado. So you see this very direct stream. It's very consistent for multiple days until right here. This is the 16th of uh, October, and there were no scoters seen on that day, according to eBird reports. The 17th, same thing, no scoters. The 18th, no scoters. And then the 19th, the scoters started up again. And this here, is the 19th where we're starting to get connection from the Southwest. Going back to the beginning, again, the 13th, we'll let this step, or sorry, this is the 12th, and we'll step to the 13th in a second once this gets going. Here we are at the 13th. On the 13th, these winds really picked up, and on the 14th, there were the first scoters seen at Chatfield Reservoir. And then the 15th, 
there were uh, scoters seen in the mountains on the 16th. There were a few seen, whether they were leftovers or not, hard to tell. But there's this pretty consistent pattern. It seems to come from Oregon down the Snake River Inlet in Idaho, maybe down to uh, Salt Lake City, and then across through some of our mountain gaps to Colorado. I've looked through 2021, and I went back to 2020, and then back to 2019. And this pattern somewhat holds true. It's not all of the time, but a good amount of the time in October, we get this pattern where it's coming through. Let me move you ahead to where I want to talk about. So these winds that are coming through the Snake River Valley, north of Salt Lake, through some gaps in the mountains in Utah and Wyoming, and ending up in Colorado, seem to be the pattern that's bringing scoters in. It's not always the case. And I haven't done enough research to fully say, yes, I know that this is true. Over the last three years, this has been true for most, I'll say, 65 to 70% of the Scoter sightings have happened during this wind pattern. So that leads us to the question that you must all be asking right now, which is, when's the next chance for Scoters in Colorado based on the weather forecast? I'm glad you asked. Thank you for asking. So here is actually today's pattern. This is the 26th and then into the 27th. And our green circle again is the Boulder area. We're now onto the 29th and we're starting to get these strong northerly winds in our area that are not connected to the west coast. But then we're coming back to the 26th, we've wrapped back around. Today was a very windy day from the west. And look, those winds were coming down that same sort of pattern that we were playing with before. So I thought today might be a good day for scoters. I didn't see any reports of them yet. So there's still work to be done. Most certainly still work to be done. If anyone happens to have a scoter sighting that you want to help me uh, be correct, I would appreciate it. If I'm not correct, it's still data points. And that's what I like. Any questions about scoters in Colorado? Elena, I see you've got something written in there. It looks like there are eddies that change and flow, and sometimes we are in an eddy. When it's migration, do these eddies help bring more birds, or is it more when there is a pass through flow? No eddy. Let me cover that later, Elena, because it actually is very relevant to when we look at this past spring, which we're going to do in just a little bit. I've got one more section that I want to cover, um, and then we'll come back to actually looking at this 2021 spring and how there were a lot of people saying, I didn't see the birds that I was expecting to see. Where are all the birds? Things like that. We'll come back. Thank you for the question. If there are others, please feel free to ask. Feel free to raise your hand in the reactions because I'm more than happy to talk about it a little bit more. As you can see, I'm not uncomfortable. I do not get uncomfortable with silence. This is what I do as my job. I teach online all the time. So I'm waiting, waiting for you whenever you're ready. I'm actually not concerned at this point. I will move along to the next section. The next thing I want to talk about is some of these European migrants that Carol had mentioned. Um, the specific one I want to talk about, she's already mentioned, which is red wing, which is not the same as the red wing blackbird. I've got a tuft of duck up here as our example, but that's not what we're going to end up talking about. There are some really good tuft of duck examples that we can. Uh, play with some other time. So I've changed our view of the world, um, and I want to 
give you a pause here for a second to help you know where we are. We'll go full screen for this in just a second. If anyone wants to hit that QR code, now is your chance. And we'll go full screen on this. So let's get you oriented. Back up here, the Aleutian Islands, coming down the Alaska coast, down Canada, west coast of the US, Baja Peninsula of Mexico. Gulf of Mexico is right here, Florida, North Carolina, up to Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Let's look across the pond. Iceland is here. The UK is this blob right in here. And then you start to see Europe all the way over here in Scandinavia. I want to show you what the normal winter pattern looks like of the winds in the northern or the southern hemisphere. Feel free to look at either one. They behave the same way. And I'm worried about the mid latitudes, so not the tropical regions. Tropical regions um, are usually from about here uh, down to about here, if I did my math correctly. Nope, it's down to here. So 25 to 25 are the values that we're looking for in terms of north and south latitude. Ignore the midsection of this image. I want you to just solely be looking at the upper portion or the lower portion of this, of this video, and we'll take a loop through. What you can see is that generally, our patterns move from west to east. Yes, there are times when we have southerly winds or northerly winds, depending on where you are in the world. Um, but generally, the overall pattern is moving from west to east. It is actually rare in the mid latitudes to get a wind from the east. That would be called a easterly wind. So the wind from the east is an easterly wind. You don't see it happening really much at all in the northern hemisphere. There's a little bit of easterly winds down here. So coming from the east to the west, a little bit in the tropics here, but I told you not to pay attention to the tropics. And you don't see much easterly. There's a little bit of easterly up here between Iceland and the UK. Some in Africa, but that's tropical Africa. So pretty clear that this is the, the pattern that we normally have, doesn't have much uh, easterly winds to it. But I want to talk to you about a specific bird. And that specific bird is the red wing. Uh, Turtus iliacus is its uh, scientific name. And it's very similar, as you can somewhat see, to our American robin, Turtus migratorius. Its typical range map for red wing is shown here with orange being breeding season, yellow being migration, and blue being winter. So you can see that there's a concentration of uh, red wings probably in Western Europe and up into the UK, but not all the way up into Scotland and definitely not into Iceland in winter. The map that I was shown, showing you before was a normal sort of winter pattern, but I wanna show you a strange winter pattern because red wings, as you can see here by this eBird uh, plot, red wings do have a tendency to be pretty concentrated in the UK. And because of that, they have a very slight chance, if we were to ever get easterly flow, to end up in the United States. And look at that. This is 2021. You can see that there were red wings in the US and Canada. I shouldn't say the US all the time. I should say North America. We have a chance for red, red wings in North America. It just so happens that 2021 was an excellent winter for red wings in North America. There were in fact 12, let me make sure, 10 different locations that had red wings in just 2021. In the previous 10 years before 2021, there were only six locations over all of those years that ever had a red wing. There were two in 2011, two in 2016, and two in 2020. 
So what made 2020 so interesting is this pattern. I'll work this for you. If anyone needs that QR code, now is the time to grab it. This is a static time. So this is one, one time only. Um, and Sandra can put the link for you to it specifically in the chat window. So if anyone needs to grab it aside from that QR code, you're welcome to do it there as well. So here we are full screen. And I wanna point out our locations again. Here's Newfoundland it is right in here. Greenland up here, Iceland here, and the UK is this blob here. And lo and behold, why would there be red wings in North America? Well, we actually had a really long pattern of easterly winds in the Northern Hemisphere over the North Atlantic connecting the UK to Canada and at other times to the US. This is only one time of the many times that this happened. It happened over about a 15 to 20 day period uh, where it was back and forth. Yes, there was easterly winds, more easterly winds, more easterly winds. Okay, here's a system that comes through, blows it out once, and then back to easterly winds, more easterly winds, more easterly winds, bringing the opportunity for red wings to come to the United States. I've just picked red wings because they are a highly, uh, what's the right way to say that? They are susceptible to vagrancy, um, highly susceptible to it actually. Um, they end up all over the place. At this exact same time, believe it or not, there was also a red wing over in British Columbia. Probably of the other side of the world, so from the Russian side, that one showed up. Haven't looked at it to, to dig too much in, but just giving you an idea that there is a pattern of vagrancy here. They do end up all over the place. There are plenty of red wings that have uh, ended up in Alaska and some in Washington uh, as well. So this is the type of pattern that we saw and it was actually uh, relevant to the climate pattern. I'm not gonna show you any climate uh, stuff right now, but there is a specific type of oceanic atmospheric oscillation as it's called, much like you know El Nino or La Nina that happens in off the Ecuadorian coast, um, there is a change in the sea surface temperature that causes changes in the overall weather patterns. There is one in the North Atlantic as well that is called the North Atlantic Oscillation. And when the North Atlantic Oscillation goes, I believe it's negative, we end up with this pattern where you end up with easterly flow from around the UK, maybe Iceland, into the Northeast portion of North America. So there's actually been researchers working on this uh, information, trying to figure out what the connection is. And it seems that it is the North Atlantic Oscillation. When it is, when it is in a negative pattern, we get this type of event. And birders should be on the lookout for that. This is just another one of my musings. If there are any questions about red wings, now is your chance to ask, because we're going to transition back to more our area to talk about our past spring if you do not have any questions. Okay, we'll take a move on. I'm gonna have you start interacting with some of this data um, to, to, get a, to get a good idea of how to use the website that I often use. Um, you can also use it, it is free of charge. I wanna show you some things about how to use that website. And I'm gonna show you some of the pattern that happened from the spring migration of 2021 to help answer some of these questions. It was back in April and then into May where people were saying things like this. Where are all the birds? This migration has been weird. Maybe that September die-off killed a lot of our migrants. Or 
maybe the wildfires last year killed a bunch of our migrants or destroyed our the habitat or there were lots of things going around lots of ideas my response with very much Garanti effect is did you consider the wind pattern what have the winds looked like recently was there a certain pattern that was setting up that didn't make it conducive for birds to show up to Colorado. This is getting back to what you were asking, Elena, um, about those eddies. I'll show you some here in just a minute, and it might make more sense. Please feel free to stop me if you do have questions when we get there. So I'm going to jump to a website right now. Um, I did not give you the QR code for this yet. I will get it for you in a little bit. But I wanted to show you some things before we started giving everyone the possibility of playing along. So I have a green circle on here that is the southeast corner of Colorado. Colorado is really nice in that it has super rectangular shape um, when it comes to the sphere of the Earth. And it goes sort of like this that up to there. And across to there, back down to about there, and across. That is Colorado. And I want you to pay attention to Colorado. Um, hopefully, this will let me move forward as I would normally do. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to step forward. This is April 9th of 2021. It doesn't so much matter the exact date. Um, I actually used this because it made it a little easier for me to annotate things. Um, and there is actually something that I, something else that I would like to annotate, which is this line right here, which is actually the mountains of Colorado. That is the um, continental divide, essentially. Not fully, but it is a good amount of it. So uh, Boulder's here, Denver's here, Colorado Springs is approximately here, Canyon City is this Push back in the mountains, uh, Walsenburg, Trinidad, um, down in this area. So you get an idea of where Colorado is, but I want to step us forward with time. And I'm going to give you a task. And that task is to raise your hand um, in the reactions or to um, unmute yourself and call it out or unmute your video and raise your hand. So I can see that you are um, trying to stop me because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step forward with time and I want you to tell me when you think there is going to be a good spring migration into Colorado. In this instance, John, you are correct. The southerly winds that we would want in, into Colorado are to our east, but this is only one day at one time. If you do want to use the reactions, um, Sandra has put a note in there to raise your hand, click your reactions button, and you'll see a raise hand option. And you can click that button as I move through. Um, so I'll try to monitor, and we'll see what's going to happen. I'm going to move in eight-hour chunks. So it's going to be somewhat jumpy, but it will give us an idea of what is kind of happening. So keep your eyes on Colorado. And I'd like a reaction when we get to a point where someone thinks migration would be coming into Colorado nicely. And this is spring migration, just for clarity, because this would be the opposite of spring migration. This is a really nice fall migration type pattern that happened in spring. So we're now to April 12th. Haven't seen any hands go up, haven't seen any comments. April 13th. I see that there's a hand, Boulder County Audubon. Sandra, you have said yes, there is something. And Carol McCaslin, you've said yes. Vicky, you're saying there's something there. So let's take a look and analyze. Maybe it was this time, maybe it was the previous time. 
uh, maybe it was even before that, I didn't see them as well as I probably should have. Let's look here and say, are we getting migrants from a, a long distance away? Somewhat, we're not getting them as, as long of a distance as we could, uh, but we definitely have winds coming into Colorado um, showing us that there is some possibility of migrants. Would I have preferred a more southerly direction where we have winds more out of something like this line here? Yeah, definitely. And would I have liked them from further away? We can get them actually coming from the Gulf of Mexico almost directly up to us. Um, so this is a, an example of yes, migration will be happening. There will be some movement, but it's not as good as it could be. Um, so I'm glad that people are catching on that there is a possibility of some uh, movement here. I did have written down the 13th as a good possible day. I'll back up just for a second. 13th, you can see that, yeah, we've got actually winds coming from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up in the Colorado. There's a chance for some birds to show up on that. It's not as direct as we might like it to be, but it's an opportunity. So April 13th might have been a good day. It might have actually been April 14th because this was late in the day. This is a 10 p.m. map. So maybe it was actually on the 14th that things started showing up sort of in this pattern. It would be worthwhile to go back on the eBird and say, was April 14th a good day? I'm going to keep moving forward. We'll play the same old game. If anyone has uh, a time that they see that they're saying, yep, that one looks really good, give a hand raise because I want to make sure that you're on to it. And it just so happens that no one has raised their hand, but I stopped anyway, because look at that pattern. That pattern is finally one of these where we're really starting to see the winds come up directly from Southern Texas. It's pretty obvious that this is gonna be a relatively good day for whatever migrants might be out there coming from the Southern Texas sort of area. And you can sort of see the way that the uh, winds are converging or funneling into different areas in Colorado. And so you get some idea of where there might be better places to go birding than others. I'm gonna keep moving forward. Barbara, I see you still have your hand up. Throw, uh, lower your hand when you get the chance um, so you can raise once again. It's in the same exact spot, hit that reactions button and hit lower hand instead of raise hand. Moving forward, there's one of those eddies that Elena was talking about. Also still a good day, same day. In fact, this is the 15th of April. This is probably one of the better days that um, the wind pattern was showing up pretty nicely. Thank you, Ron, for throwing a hand up saying, yep, that looks good. But then it turns around. Eight hours later, we are not in that same situation. We've definitely crossed into a north wind again. So that one didn't stay for very long. And that becomes slightly problematic. We want that pattern there for a long time. So I'm gonna step forward again. We'll keep going. Plenty of northerly winds here. And we're 18 days into April. And we are just getting dumped on from the north. Pardon me for a minute while I close my door. So we've still got these northerly winds and we're now to the 20th of April. And here we get a turnaround slightly of those winds, but it's not from very far away. So there will be some migration looking better. April 21st, midday, starting to be April 21st at 10 p.m. I see some hands up. Thank you. But then it immediately goes to this flow that goes past us. We've had this time on the 22nd of April here where the birds would likely just blow right by us. They'd go to Nebraska, they'd go to Montana, they'd go well further north. This is the type of pattern that happened to us all spring long. There was never really a time when we came 
where it became very clear that the birds would be coming directly to us. I've shown you some of the few instances where it happened. Again, we get swept out. We're now in very weak westerly winds to northerly winds as well, still in northerly winds. And we're almost through April. There's a shift. We've turned back to southerly winds from West Texas. So we can still get some, some birds out of that. We can also get some birds from the uh, Southwest United States, definitely onto the West Slope. And look, it's starting to get stronger. Uh, 10 o'clock, 10 in the evening, 10 p.m. And the next moment, which is 6 a.m., the birds would have left Western Texas coming towards us. And then eight hours later, they would end up going past us. This is the pattern that we ended up with over and over and over again. Just moving forward a bit more, I'm not going to go all the way through. Um, you can always take some time to go take a look at what happened through all of May. I saw, let's see, I saw a few days in May that looked really good. And I'll just jump to one right now just to show you. Uh, it's May 21st into 22nd. So here we've got a pattern. This is 6 a.m. on the 21st, 2 p.m. on the 21st. Look at how much flow there is from the south. There's even a hurricane in here um, if you're keeping track. And all of this flow, there's going to be so many migrants that could ride in on this. But where are they going to end up? Currently, they're going to end up probably in the Wyoming because here's where the winds stop, um, stop the birds from moving north. Maybe they'll even end up here in like Riverton. Moving forward eight more hours. There's a little bit of stoppage here in the northern uh, portion of Colorado where birds might converge, but it's definitely not in the front range anymore. Continuing further, same thing, I-76 corridor. Uh, maybe go out to Pruitt Reservoir or some of those locations and you have a better chance. And here we are at finally one of the best moments that possibly happened in all of May, um, May 22nd. Really good flow, but again, not super convergent into any one location. And then on the 23rd, we're back to just birds streaming through Colorado. So the answer to some of the spring question is, in my head, this doesn't mean it's the full answer, is that the birds were actually flying directly over us because there was no reason for them to stop. It didn't make any sense for them to stop, so why would they? If they have a destination that is not Colorado, keep on going. The winds are helping you be efficient. Uh, save the energy. Use it now while you have it and only stop to refuel if necessary. Are there any questions about this, this past spring? Um, I want to give you um, the link. Here is where I started. Everyone here. There's the link where I started from. If you want to do this same exercise yourself and be more specific, um, you are welcome to do that. Um, not right now, though. Cool. John, I've, I see your question in the chat window. Do most birds continue flying at night? Um, the tendency actually for, I'm going to try to be very specific about this, ducks, gulls, shorebirds, and almost all of the passerines actually migrate at night more frequently than they migrate during the day. Um, they try to feed during the day. A bunch of these um, birds are insectivores. And because of their insectivore nature, they want to be out when the insects are most active. So they will stop to feed during the day. Um, while at night, they will fly. So they will actually be awake for days on end and only take short breaks uh, to actually rest. It's all feeding all the time. And their hormones actually make it so they can do this type of thing. Uh, good question, John. Um, I hope I answered it for you. 
Peter, I see a question. There was a shorebird fallout in Boulder County on April 15th and 16th, which seems to correspond with the transition from southerly to northerly winds that I showed. Let's jump back and take a look at it, because Peter, I'm always happy to entertain these types of questions. April 15th, right here. Um, this is 6 a.m. on April 15th. Peter, do you remember exact timings of those? Was it actually on the 15th that it started? Or was it sort of like the 15th, some birds were there, but the 16th, then all the birds ramped up? Feel free to unmute yourself, Peter, or yeah, you saw them on the 16th. So let's just play it as, look, that was the flow that we were looking at. And where is Lagerman? Lagerman's really close to where I live. So let's move our little box there. Um, so Lagerman Reservoir is right near where I live. Um, and you can see that there is a good amount of flow that would end up in that vicinity at 14. So this is 2 p.m. on the 15th. Let's move forward a little more and see if we have any more reason. Not really looking like there was much reason for them to, to show up at this time exactly, maybe further south in the Arkansas Valley. And then we've switched to that um, cold frontal passage, essentially, there's a cold front back, back in here. Um, so it does seem like there could have been a time. I'm gonna do this by hours at this point. Um, so I'm gonna back up, uh, this will be 5 a.m. We'll watch that front sort of move north. Here's that front right here. Keep watching it, it's gonna move northward because I'm going backwards. And the cold front has essentially met its demise at this point. It is so tiny that we can't even really find it. Um, but you can definitely tell that there was a lot of uh, flow into the mountains. Um, maybe it was just that Lagerman happened to be a spot where lots of people ended up going, as opposed to maybe there was something at Chatfield, maybe there was something at Pueblo, maybe there was something um, at Aurora Reservoir, Bar Lake, things like that. This was a, a pattern that really showed almost anywhere on the front range could have gotten a, a nice day, um, and especially at that time of year. Uh, Joe, I see you mentioning um, for additional strength, did Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma have strong migra migration observations? Joe, I have to be honest, I didn't look. Um, I, I tend to look at Colorado um, just because it's actually easier for me to understand because I know where all the birding locations are. It makes it a little easier for me to be able to put those wind patterns together. Um, but it's definitely worth uh, hypothesizing and playing around and seeing what happens. Good question. And thank you, Peter, for pointing out April 15th, 16th. I remember there was a Lagerman day. I have it written on my post-it of what I wanted to cover. Just didn't end up getting to it as, a, as an example. So thank you. Other questions about this past spring while we're sitting here floating around in some of these details. question Brian is um, is the pattern that the, the the sort of general visual that we're looking for here is strong flow in but then a, a, a lack of strong flow so a blue place where they're going to stop it's the wind so ending that we it need. could be either blue or um, I was trying to think of an example um, Blue just means that the winds are slow there. And in our case, because we have the mountains, which I've annotated here, we're almost guaranteed to end up with blue. Um, it just doesn't, it doesn't always look that way. I'm trying to think of a, a day that would make sense to show you. Um, let's go back to this one. I'm gonna remove my annotations. So in this case, this was this is actually a day when a bunch of American golden plovers showed up in all of Colorado. This was a fall migration day. And I told you that there was um, a cold front through here that draped down like this and actually wrapped back up against the mountains like so. So you can definitely see that the mountains are still there. But this cold front itself was actually an interesting location as well. And the reason that that is interesting is because of the change in wind direction. So we have, if a bird were flying on these winds here, they'd come down and they'd meet this cold front and they'd maybe try to cross it. And when they try to cross it, they actually find that the winds are out of the south on the other side. 
Um, uh, a front really isn't a barrier for a bird for the most part. Um, cold fronts, warm fronts, stationary fronts, it's not a boundary. If it's precipitating, it's annoying and they don't wanna fly through it, so they'll go to the ground. But what's worse is actually the switch of the winds. So you've got north winds here that a bird would be happy to, to ride on in the fall, but then they get here and they say, south winds, I don't like this. I don't wanna do that. Time to stop and feed for a bit until the wind pattern becomes better for me. I know that's somewhat anthropomorphized and I apologize for that. It's one of the easier ways to have that conversation. Birds are efficiency seeking, so they don't like to keep flying when the winds are in their face when they're trying to go somewhere. So oftentimes that's when they go to the ground. Um, I don't have any idea who asked that question. I didn't see the unmuting. Thank you to whoever that was. My apologies for not catching exactly who it was. Um, did that clarify the answer to that question? It's not exactly just the blue area. Sometimes it's a, a switch over. Yes, this is Sandra, and that was my question. And, and, and so I wanted to distinguish between the places where there's really strong uh, flow is, is where the wind is, the birds are going to keep going with the wind, and, and you want to look for places where they may be trapped or stopped or have reason to yeah. fall out. So there's, there's convergence of some variety, whether that's the winds coming together and the birds are traveling on this side and they suddenly meet and they're like, yeah, this isn't working for me. I don't want to keep flying in this other wind. That's where they're going to go down. Um, and if you can find that pattern sitting in the same spot for a really long time, that's when you can get really good convergence or um, aggregation, concentration of birds in a single location. Thanks again for the questions. Thanks. Um, I do have one other thing that I wanted to start getting to that I need to get back to. Um, the last thing I'm gonna do is show you how to use that website because I don't want you leaving here watching me play with this website and then you don't know how to do it. And I, every single time I give this presentation, people say, how do you use that website? What is the way to, to go about doing this sort of analysis? So what I wanna do, is show you some of that. Uh, in the chat window, I will give you a link, but you do not need to go there because I will be showing um, on screen the whole entire menu structure and uh, talking you through what happens. If you would like to go there, try to keep me available as well as the website so you can sort of watch along. With the last six or 10 minutes that I have here, depending on when, when we call it quits, I will walk you through how to use this website. This is just one example. Uh, this happens to be April 9th, like we had already been looking at. It sets you up for the task of going back and looking at spring migration again. If you click in the bottom left-hand corner on that Earth button, um, it will show up a menu like so. And when you uh, zoom in on that menu, which you cannot do, but I can do uh, via PowerPoint here. It looks like so. I'm going to go through all of the information that's in this menu so you know how to use it. In that menu, the first thing you'll see at the top is your latitude and longitude of whatever green circle may be on there. Um, the green circle will get to how it is captured and how it uh, becomes available in just a minute. So at the moment, if you went to that website, this is the same latitude and longitude that you should see. And you should also see the green circle in the exact southeast corner of Colorado because it is 37 north, 102 west is the southeast corner of Colorado. Moving down the uh, menu, the next thing down is the winds at the green circle. So the, this first black box up here is all about the green circle, which is the location that uh, you have provided for the website. In this case, the winds were 355 degrees. So that is out of the north, almost exactly, um, at 61 kilometers per hour in this case. If you click on that km uh, slash h, it will change your units. There's kilometers per hour, there's knots, there's meters per second and there's miles per hour. You can click through that to find one that makes sense for you. 
Moving down the list, I'm going to skip over the data line because we'll talk about it more as we go further down. The date is listed there in year, month, day, and then hour. If you click on the local or the UTC here, it will switch your times to be Greenwich Mean Time, which is universal time coordinate, which is what UTC stands for, or it will switch it to local time. And that local time is based on your computer's clock, essentially. Most people will probably want to leave it on local time as a way to help them understand uh, what time that map is for. I skipped over the score source. I skipped over the scale to get you to that controls line. This is where the fun really gets to happen. This is where you get to control uh, moving forward and backward in time. And that may either be with the calendar, which is this little button right here. And that can pop you up a calendar that helps you move all the way back to 2013. There is data available back to 2013. And you can move forward into the future I think in the future we get five days forward is what's available on this website. To move backwards in time with the arrows, those two arrows right there, the single left-hand arrow is a minus one hour. The double left-hand arrow is minus eight hours. The next two arrows over are plus one hour and plus eight hours. So those are our time controls. That's how you can move through the world in time. Um, that's a nice way to jump back to a specific day like we did with April 15th and 16th and say, oh, what happened that day? Let me see if this makes sense based on the birds that I saw. Was the wind pattern good? And yes, in fact, it was. This is probably the other button that people use the most. It's the show your location button. It's this little sort of compass rose um, that points to the Northeast in this case. When you click on that, it will ask you if you would like to allow this website to use your location. If you say allow, it will put the green circle on the map exactly where you are. Um, that's super useful for when you're trying to figure out where you are in the world, where the winds are uh, doing the work, um, and it helps you figure out the best places to go. Moving down the list a little further, here's the height uh, row. And the height that I suggest you put it on is 850 hectopascals. Um, that is because it is slightly off the ground for the eastern plains of the United States. It is, in fact, actually at the ground here in the Denver area. Um, so it's not the best answer. Uh, if we had something between 850 hectopascals and 700 hectopascals, that would be a heck of a lot more useful. But this website does not have that. 700 hectopascals is like at the top of Long's Peak, uh, as an example. So it's not exactly where we want to be. We want to be lower than that. And the 850 winds seem to show a better pattern, uh, more realistic pattern to what the birds would be dealing with than the 700 millibar pattern, 700 hectopascal pattern. So that's why I always leave it on 850 um, for us around here. If you move further east, where we get out of the Great Plains and beyond. And sometimes the closer you get to the coast, you can actually move down to a lower level, which is 1,000 hectopascals. And that could be a useful uh, map to look at as well. But for us, uh, not the best place. Joe, I see you talking about VPN. If you are VPNing, your location might be wrong. Um, so that may be a, a, a possible problem as well. Thank you for bringing that up, Joe. I wasn't thinking well enough. The last line that I want to show you is the overlays line. There's a whole section of different overlays that you can uh, place on here. The first one is wind, which is where I normally start. Um, it is the colors of the winds. It is not the lines. The lines will always be there. So the streamlines will be uh, available as long as you keep the animate wind line on. But you can change through to the temperature, to the relative humidity, which is this one, wind power density, which I don't even know the equation for, probably doesn't matter too much. Um, three HPA is three hour precipitation accumulation, um, which is sort of fun to look at when you see some of these patterns that are coming up to Colorado, but you see some sort of discontinuity in the straight line. Sometimes there's precipitation right there. 
which might make a bird stop coming all the way through that line, through that pathway. So it's sometimes useful to look at 3-HPA, three hour precipitation accumulation. CAPE, again, not something you need to worry about. TPW, also something, pretty much all the rest of these aren't, aren't worth your time is, uh, is my feeling, but you're welcome to look at them. You're welcome to ask questions about them. I'm always available to answer some of those. So with that knowledge, you now have the ability to go to that website and play around. Because of that, I'm going to let you play around. And what I want to do is actually say thank you, um, because this is really the end. I want to give you the time to play around. You can ask me questions while I'm still here. Um, and you can also email me. There's my email address. Um, and I will also put that in the chat window for you. Hopefully I spelled my email address correctly. Yes, I did. Um, so it is available to you. You can feel free to copy that out. Um, I love to answer questions about all this uh, content. It's not always what I have the time for, but it is one of the things that I love to do with my time. So with that, I'll say thank you and I'll take any questions that anyone has. You can use your reaction button to uh, send Brian a, an applause or a, a thanks. Any questions? Thank you, Pete Billig and Elena. I appreciate being here. And thank you for the applause to those of you who are reacting. Uh, Peter, I see you've got a hand up with a question. Peter Ghent, um, you're welcome to use your mic. Go ahead. Uh, so what's been happening this fall? There have been even fewer passerines around this fall than in the spring. It's been one of the worst September, Octobers I can remember for uh, rare passerines in Boulder. So let's see, let me close out some of these and make sure I'm showing you the right things. Um, so let's talk about some of the current forecast. This is, let's set it to now. Let's make sure we're there. So this is current conditions. And um, I, I think it's, I'll say I haven't looked, Peter, specifically at this fall because I like to wait until the season's over to really do an, an analysis on it because there's always things that happen that come up that it's like, oh yeah, if I would have thought of that, that would have made more sense for the analysis. But let's look at right now. Um, and then we'll go backwards from here because going into the future doesn't make much sense at this point because we don't know what the results are going to be. So I'm moving backwards with time. We have southerly flow, more southerly flow, continued southerly flow, and it has been a lot of this. We've been relatively warm um, until somewhat recently. Trying to go back and find a time here for you, Peter, that makes any good sense for any sort of um, fall migration. And I want to be very clear about something right now because this has been really cool recently. Um, there have been southern birds showing up in Saskatchewan and Quebec recently. I am not exactly sure why until I look at exactly this image and say to myself, well, things like crested caracara that are often um, vagrants, interesting vagrants in fall, there's a crested caracara currently in Saskatchewan, and here is my guess why. You can see the exact pathway of why they would end up in Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan is uh, in here approximately, for those who don't know their Canadian uh, geography. So back to your question, Peter, um, let's keep going backwards. And I mean, this is really what I do when someone asks a question like this. So it's, this is on the fly, we're taking a look. There hasn't really been, this is over just the last five days, there hasn't really been a good strong front that has specifically been bringing anything to us. These fronts, this one right here, 
is actually probably a relatively good front uh, for some people to get migrants. Anyone in probably Nebraska up here, yep, there's the river, Nebraska through Kansas into Oklahoma, down into Texas, they were probably getting some nice migrants for this. But we didn't end up with a, uh, a real good chance to have those winds stop in Colorado. Here I'm going back. This would be the one opportunity that I saw. Actually, we'll leave it here. This is the one opportunity that I saw when I was going backwards that we had any chance of really nice migrants, um, which is the 19th of October. Um, Peter, I'm going to pause on your conversation and we can keep doing that. Uh, we can keep going backwards. We could keep having it. Um, but I think. I've mostly answered your question, and we can play uh, more after I answer some other questions if you still want to stick around and do that. Um, Joe, I see you've got a question. Oh, cool. it's not a question, it's a comment. Thank you, Joe. It is a very useful website. It is one of the simpler ones out there for making these types of forecasts. Um, so enjoy it, take some time to play with it. Um, yeah. A uh, direct message came to me, what is the typical altitude range for migratory passwords? Um, the typical migra migration range is somewhere between 500 meters above the ground and 1,500 meters above the ground. Um, it really just depends on the password and also um, it is dependent on the weather. As the cloud level, if there's clouds overnight, if the cloud level comes down, the birds will be concentrated more below those clouds. They don't really want to fly through the clouds. So they become concentrated more below that. And so if we ever end up with a day like what's on screen here, um, where we would have a nice northerly flow, um, and there were likely some clouds associated with this, uh, you might have cloud cover back here, and you would get birds flying under those clouds and calling at night. I live right across the street from a uh, baseball stadium. Um, not a major stadium, just like, you know, four baseball diamonds, and they have lights for at night. And occasionally, um, when there's a game going on or when there's not going a game, uh, not a game going on, especially, I can go over there and listen to migrants flying by, and they're responding to the lights, actually. Um, it can be confusing for them, unfortunately, um, but it, it does make them call, so I could, in theory, get some birds um, in the overnight hours and pick up those. If you really want to go into nocturnal migration, go talk to Ted Floyd or uh, to Nathan Piccolo. Uh, they'll both give you a whole rundown of how best to do that. Other questions from anyone or do we take it back to Peter and we play more backwards in time? I have a question, Brian. Is when, we, when you go backwards in time, is it the model for past days or is it the actual weather? None of this is the actual weather. Um, and I appreciate you asking that. Um, this is all model data. We do not have observations all over the world like this that would be able to give us this type of view. So this is always model data. And when you go backwards in time, it is the model data that matches that time. So the closest one to that time is what it's giving you. And I know that's not initially going to make sense. Um, the close, oh man, I'm going into all sorts of nerdiness. Um, so let's say right now is here and backwards in time. I think it might make sense to go this way. That seems backwards on a timeline, right? Um, if we go backwards in time, you could pick a time um, that the model would have run. And then maybe like three hours after that, you would use the model run that was done at that time, but use the three hour ahead forecast because our models will only run every six hours. So then when you move six hours forward, there will actually be a model run that occurred at that time. So you can use that time. And then three hours later, you'd have to use the forecast from that run and then move forward. And over and over again, that happens. Did that make sense or did I just confuse the heck out of that? I think I understand. I guess my question is, are the models correct enough that when you look at the model for the past, you can say this explains why there were, you know, 
whatever, um, Southern Birds in Saskatchewan or whatever? Um, you're definitely picking up on the right things here. Um, there are small dots on my screen that you might be able to see right now. Um, and if I zoom in, it'll become even clearer. No, it's not really much clearer. Each of these dots is where there is data. And, and by data, I mean that's where the model is outputting some value. And all the rest of this is interpolated in between. So really the model is not that accurate. Um, and thus the reason why it's nice to have a human involved in making a forecast, because there's a lot of stuff that happens um, from Longmont to Boulder in terms of the weather, but that's actually the distance uh, that we don't have data. We don't have data from Longmont to Boulder, just using a, a size here. These are um, 13 kilometer grid boxes. So within between each of these dots is 13 kilometers and 13 kilometers this way. So my statement of Longmont to Boulder is a little too big, um, but there is no data in between those. There are just points that have certain data. And there are all sorts of problems um, with using model data as real data. But generally, it's pretty good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, yeah, you get a lot of model forecasts that are really good. 80% of the time, you get a nice model forecast. The other 20%, you end up in this sort of, eh, it's not that great. Did that help, Sandra? Or yes, thank you. I'm, cool. I'm sure uh, I could go in the weeds, but I will, I will spare others. There is a question in the chat from John Reed. Why are some birds like red wings highly susceptible to being vagrants? Um, I don't know. I don't know why certain birds um, are vagrants compared to others. Um, it's, I, I know there's a whole conversation going on right now about the brown-headed nuthatch that's in Kansas and how nut, that type of nuthatch isn't very susceptible to vagrancy. Um, and some of the comments that are going on in there are about some of the research that's happening of certain birds specifically flying away from where they are currently in higher concentrations um, to find a new place to live because the competition is too great. And so that might be a reason, but that's certainly not all of the possible reasons why certain birds are susceptible to vagrancy and others are not. So John, I don't really have a great answer for you, but I'm sure there are papers out there um, to look at because there are a lot of people talking about it, specifically about the brown headed nut hatch right now. Other questions, comments? Thank you, John, for the thumbs up and the clarity. Appreciate it. Any other questions? I can stick around for a bit longer. Um, Carol, Sandra, anyone need to wrap it up, feel free. We're happy to hang out a little bit. If others want to um, ask a specific question or muck around a bit with the tool. Yeah, feel free to muck around and ask questions because there's definitely some stuff that could be uh, a little iffy as you start playing. Question from Ron in the chat. Yeah, Ron, um, I'm too meteorological. Um, I just see these fronts just sort of coming out at me all the time. Um, I'm trying to think if there is a good, a good field to plot for you that would make it clearer. It's not a good color scale. Temperature gives you some sense of where the fronts are. Like you can see that you've got some orange kind of uh, getting sucked up into this low pressure center here. Counterclockwise rotations are low pressure centers. Um, so there's, there's definitely flow up into that, bringing some of that warm, moist likely air up in there while there's cold air coming behind. So this line right here 
is that cold front. Temperature might be the most useful to use for, um, for most people. Let me move forward and see if there's a, another time that looks really good that you can, yeah, see, this is what starts to happen. Um, you get this like blue to green and it really calls attention to itself. Um, and that's just the color scale uh, because it does have this very rapid blue to green, as you can see here on the color scale. Um, and so it, it becomes very like, it draws your attention, but it's not actually where the front is. So that's why I'm a little hesitant to give you temperature as the best option. Um, to me, it's a lot about where the winds change dramatically. So this thing right here, where you get this um, north, northwesterly flow to northerly flow to northeasterly flow, and then this very sudden uh, turn to southeasterly flow, sorry, southwesterly flow, excuse me. And that's where that front is. It's right along there. Um, Elena, I'll get to your question in a second. I'm trying to find some other options that might work. Mean sea level pressure doesn't show you well enough like it should because it doesn't have a good color scale on it. Yeah, I don't think there's a good, a good option aside from temperature um, as uh, temperature and wind are really the best option we're going to have of the plot of the variables that are plottable on this website. Ron, does that make sense? Do you have any more questions about that? Elena, let me get to your questions. It's a little specific, but can you explain what is going on with that strong white line running northwest to southeast? It was in the image that was on a little while ago. It was on oh, a little while ago. Okay. Um, yeah, there. It's just so interesting. Right here or, oh, this line here. Is that the one you mean? Actually, the one just a little bit to the northwest of there, it's uh, this one. That, that one. Yeah, because it's okay. just like, yeah, it's so interesting. Um, yes, I can explain it. How much time do we want to spend explaining it is a different story. Um, so in the atmosphere, I know this seems odd, but I'm like looking around for something to play with. Um, in the atmosphere, air does not flow directly horizontally. It flows up and down on slopes. So North American birds, if you need it. Um, this is our slope. Uh, so air may be coming down a slope or maybe going up a slope. And these are actually interactive slopes is what's going on. So there's a very strong slope um, back here uh, that is actually then digging underneath. It's actually going down into the ground here, while this slope of, of air is actually sort of going, let's say sort of above that. I know that doesn't make sense because we're looking at an individual surface here that is a consistent surface, um, but these are called conveyor belts. And so you can think of them as these like air moving along this conveyor belt while there's other air maybe moving in a different direction, crossing sort of in these different patterns through the atmosphere. So what we have here is we actually have a very broad, large, what we call warm conveyor belt that is all of sort of this area here. I'm trying to, I'll, actually, let me annotate it. That's probably the better way to do it. And I'll use colors that make some sense. Um, let's go warm conveyor belt is like this. Not the greatest outline I've ever made, but it gives you some ideas. This is all around here. So all of the area that is flowing through here, through here, and all the way out here is what we call the warm conveyor belt. Let me give you another example. We do use orange uh, for this specific conveyor belt. This is called the dry conveyor belt. And there's one that goes in and out like this and covers this whole area as such. That. That's one dry conveyor belt, but there's another one right next to it that goes like this and lives sort of in that hole that it has made. So the flow then goes in, wraps in like that, goes in like this and does wrap back out like that. 
giving you some idea here as best I can with my hand drawn uh, adventure in dry conveyor belt and warm conveyor belt play. Um, so there's actually different streams of air is what this is all coming down to. And you can actually see that somewhat in the temperature field. When you look at the temperature, you start to see that there's a colder area back here, an even colder area back in here um, that is wrapping into this warm area that's coming through here. And there's actually another front that I would have to analyze on here that is this uh, convergence line right through here. But I'm not going to do that for at the moment. Does that help make some clarity, Elena? I know that was like a lot of meteorology, a lot of 3D. Um, thank you for the thanks in the, um, in the chat. Sandra is calling it quits on us. I appreciate the uh, timekeeping. Thank you everyone, as Sandra has already said, thanks for coming. Um, and the video will be edited and put up on the YouTube channel. Thank you so Thank much, you, Brian. Brian. Great. Thanks very much. It was wonderful. Elena, I can stick around to answer your question if you still do need more. Thanks everyone, good night. Good night.